If you guys were one of our students or chaperones that uh, went on the trip, would you guys just stand up really quick? We just want to acknowledge that you guys are here today. Would y'all thank them for going, especially our chaperones, all right? We got several of our students here as well. And uh, you guys, we took a bunch. You guys can have a seat. We took a bunch from uh, Dayton Christian School, about 25 or so. Then we had about 30 or so, about 50 uh, from Grace Point, about 55 on that bus. And I'll just be honest with you, it was awesome spending some time with your kids and uh, with some of you adults as well. I mean, it was just one of the most refreshing trips that I've ever been on. Most of the time, you lose a lot of sleep, and we definitely did that on trips like that. But it was also just a really, really um, awesome thing just to see and get to know a lot of your students better. And uh, a lot of them, man, they've got some amazing hidden talents, all right, kind of like Ashton right there. Uh, Ashton, by the way, he can, uh, he can if you, you can mess around with a U- Rubik's Cube, he just kind of carries one in his pocket just everywhere he goes. He just kind of hands it to you, and, and then he'll, you just, he says, just mess it up. So you just mess it up as much as you want, as much as you want, and then like in 30 seconds or less, it's back to normal. It's just one of the most amazing things, all right, that I've ever seen. So that's definitely a superhuman gift for sure. But just so thankful for all those of you guys who have been praying, all right, the last few weeks, praying for our students and chaperones this past week, but also those of you guys who have been going through our prayer book. And I've got a lot of questions about this prayer book. A couple people said, hey, what does this whole revitalization thing, uh, this word mean? And I just want to tell you what it means for us here at Grace Point. This is basically what it means as a young church, right? We're not a church 50 years old that's like trying to figure out what to do with ourselves. There's a lot of amazing things happening here at Grace Point. But for us, this is what it means. It means that we as a church, we want to make sure here in 2020 that we are as focused and refocused as we possibly can be on sharing the gospel with people outside of just the people that we already have come in contact with, outside of just already the people that we think of as the church, all right? We wanna come in contact with new people this year that need to know Jesus, amen? That's, and that's my heart. And that's what we wanna do. That's why we take student trips. This last week, I'm I'm, I'm gonna get in the message here in a second, but here's the thing. This past, this past week, I got, this past Sunday night, I got a chance to pray uh, with a kid named Dylan. Dylan's been coming. Is Dylan here this morning? He'd be cool. He went home, told his parents. He's, like, excited about what God's doing. Dylan has been off and on coming to our church for four or five years, really all the way back since about the time we started in the school. And we've been praying for Dylan for four or five years. And Dylan, this past Sunday night, prayed to receive Jesus Christ. You guys, we're going to baptize him here in a few weeks on his 16th birthday right over there. All right, He said he wanted to wait till his 16th birthday, and uh, we're going to baptize him here in February. But, man, I am so excited about what God is doing, and so excited about what God's doing in the life of our church. While all of that was going on, all right, we were doing the trip and everything, man, there was a group that was organizing that went into the schools this week and loved on kids. About 12 of you guys, y'all went in, and you you went to Franklin High School. You spent all day there, and you guys loved on kids and helped them learn how to forgive each other and learn how to maybe get past some of their past and and showed them that there was even some stories I heard where some people were saying, you know what, if you can get through what you got through, then maybe I can too. You guys, that's what we're about is we want to love on our community this year. We want to love on each other this year, and we want to pray for each other. And Man, I'm just, I, I'm just so excited. Today. And today we're going to be talking about really what it means to continue as we pray, just to surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not maybe just enough to just come to church or just maybe do churchy things, but the question is in our hearts, have we truly surrendered to Jesus, and is there anything new maybe that God would be bringing to our attention today that we need to surrender to him? So if you would, open up your Bibles to Luke 9, 23 through 27 this morning. We're gonna check this out. As I talk about the idea of lordship and surrender, our our Jewish friends today, they often use Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 as kind of a confession of faith. Uh, Those verses say this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that's something a lot of times you will hear Uh, Jewish people say it's a confession of lordship. There's only one God. He is Yahweh is what they're saying, the Lord. The Christians of the New Testament, they also confess lordship. They said Jesus is Lord. All right, Romans 10, 9, and 10, we see them saying this. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Philippians 2, 11, on and on I could go, where you just see Christians over and over and over again saying Jesus is not just Savior, but Jesus is also Lord. And I think we should notice, too, that over and over and over again in Scripture, God says he's going to do this Or that, so that people will know that I am the Lord. So as a result, I think it's easy, it should be easy for us to say that God is Lord is a fundamental part of our confession as a people. It was was part of the confession of people in the Old Testament, part of the confession of people in the New Testament to say 
that Jesus is Lord. This, in fact, I think is one and the same testimony. It's a testimony that we who claim Christ, though, are often quick sometimes to desert. We want to make him our, and I didn't say desert for those of you guys who are hungry. Or I said quick to desert, all right? I think it's easy a lot of times, and we stress, and we'll always stress here at Grace Point that Jesus is our Savior. But the question is, do we really understand today what it means to make him Lord. And the question sometimes is even asked, can you really make Jesus your Savior but not make him Lord? I want to come back to that question here in just a second. But I'd like for all of us just for a second this morning just to be honest with ourselves, all right? And I want to ask a really deep theological question this morning. And I think, I think we're going to put it up on the screen here, all right? This is just as deep as that one. But here's the next one, okay? Have you ever accidentally run over anything? All right, I'm like talking about your car. All right, anybody ever done that? Just tell, you what, tell the person next to you, don't raise your hand. All right, we might have to arrest you. All right, but all right, depending on what you ran over. But uh, all right, if you've ever run over anything, just tell the person all right, in the room next to you what you've run over. What's the worst thing, or maybe the next to worst thing, all right, that you've ever run over? All right, a few of you guys. All right, maybe some squirrels. All right, anybody ever run, run over some squirrels? Maybe, maybe a turtle. All right. A possum. Hopefully you never had one of those moments that I've had was like, what was that speed bump? All right, that's never a good thing, all right, right there. (laughs) Oh, wait, there was no speed bump. All right, that's not good. But one of the worst things that I ever did, all right, when I accidentally ran over something, and I'm definitely not known for my amazing driving skills, all right, just personally, if you've ever rode with me, all right. But one of the worst things that I ever did is I actually... uh, I actually was, was driving, I, maybe, I think it was actually to church one morning. I was driving my whole family to church. And we, at my, in my family, we do a weird thing. It's kind of something that's been passed on from my mom, all right? She used to do this with us, when, with me when we were kids. She would tell something called squeaky stories, all right? And, and basically, she was very creative. And so she would just make up these, these stories about this squirrel that lived in our backyard, all right? And, and she would make up this story about squeaky. And that's kind of one of the ways that she got us to go to bed at night. That's why I'm so strange, all right, is I heard squeaky stories all growing up. My mom would just make them up off the top of her head. And sometimes there was a life lesson. And sometimes it was just a really quick story to get us to go to bed. I mean, it was just kind of something like that. And she would just make these stories up off the top of her head. And so that's something that I decided to start doing with my kids. I thought, hey, this sounds like a great idea. I'll start making up some squeaky stories as well. And so, uh, and so I've been telling my kids this when they were a little bit younger all about Squeaky, and Squeaky's kind of always, and every time we'd see a squirrel, oh, hey, it's Squeaky, you know, and that's just kind of what we do. And so one morning, we're, we're late to church, and we're all in the minivan, and we're driving to church, and all of a sudden, a squirrel runs out right under me, and boom, boom. <laughs> and that wasn't the worst part, because all the kids saw it, too, and they're like, Squeaky, no! I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I just wanted to turn the car back around and just go home at that point because I was just like, oh, my goodness, that's terrible. I've definitely run over a few things. But last night, I was driving home back on Crossley, and I saw a huge deer in the road. I literally, I took a right, and I thankfully slowed down. I didn't hit the deer. Don't worry. I did not hit the deer, all right? But I saw the deer, and I was like, whoa, okay, that, that, that deer, all right, it was like one of those things I'm like, I, I got to miss that. Presley was in the back seat. She's like, Daddy, is that a Presley-sized deer or a daddy deer? And I'm like, that was a daddy deer right there. That was a daddy deer. Definitely huge deer in the road. And, I, and here's the thing. It just got me thinking. I, I'm not always certain what's in the road on my journey, all right, when I'm driving along and what I might have bumped over. But I was very certain last night. And I think in the same way, people may not always be certain what they see on their journey, but they ought to know what they see when they see us. Does that make sense? I mean, we ought to be people that people know, all right, man, this is a follower of Jesus, and they should know us, the Bible says, by our fruit. They should know us when they look at us, what they see. They shouldn't be wondering, is this a person a Christian? Is, are they not? I, I can't figure it out when we're at our workplace. I, I can't figure it out when we're in our neighborhood. I can't figure it out when you go to Starbucks or for some fast food place. Anywhere you go, like, we ought to be known as followers of Jesus, And I'll just tell you this morning, if you prayed a prayer to ask Jesus to save you, but you've never started living for and following him, can I just tell you something this morning? This is a hard thing to say, but I just want to tell you, I don't know where you're headed. If you don't live for Jesus and you don't follow Jesus, but you just prayed a prayer one time, I don't know what's going to happen to you at the end of this life. I don't know where you are. Jesus gave his life for us, and the expectation is that we will give our life back to him. If you think in this life that you're good because you got saved, but you don't live a life that honors God in any category, in any area, then there should be a red flag in your heart. 
cow can say all day it's a chicken, but in the end, everybody knows what it really is, a cow. My concern and my burden is that there's a lot of people who have heard all about Jesus, and they know what he's done for them, but they've never said, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. And see, that's what I think it means to make Jesus your Lord. If we really want to see the lordship of Christ rule and reign in our lives, it requires every individual member honoring and obeying Christ above all other influencing factors. Luke describes what this looks like. Look with me in the text this morning, Luke 9, 23 through 27. And this is what it says. Some of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. This is what it says. It says, Jesus was saying to them all that were listening, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Very short. We're going to read some more in a little bit, but very short. Read it with me one more time. It says, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Read a story recently about a guy that was joining the Navy. He's a new recruit, and he asked his officer for a pass so that he could go and attend a wedding. The officer gave him a pass, but informed the young man he'd have to be back by 7 p.m. on Sunday. The recruit said, you don't understand, sir. I, I'm, I'm in the wedding. He says, no, you don't understand. The officer shot back, you're in the Navy. See, sometimes I wonder if we truly know what it means when we say that we follow Christ. When we say that Jesus is my, not just Savior, but my Lord and Savior. I wonder, do we truly understand what this meant for the people that listened to this verse for the first time? That these people who heard from Jesus, if anybody wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. See, a cross for us is just something that kind of hangs around the neck, right? A cross for us is, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And we kind of think about that a little bit. But we don't have crosses right out here on the corner where people are hanging, where we really get what a cross was. Like the people who were reading this got what a cross was. Really, the best way we could maybe understand this verse would be to say he must deny himself and take up his electric chair daily, maybe, and follow me. Take up his lethal injection daily and follow me. Take up his hanging daily and follow me. That's what people would have heard when they first read this verse. They would have just thought of, oh, the cross, like sometimes we think. See, shortly after, right before this verse, shortly after Peter answered Jesus' question to, to his disciples, who do the people say that I am? Peter gave him an answer. He said, Jesus, they say that we, we're all convinced that you're the Christ, which you're the Messiah, you're God. We, we kind of think that, all right? We're, we're all kind of thinking that. And as a result of Peter's declaration, Jesus gave his disciples three very specific instructions. He said they should not yet make his lordship known to others, that was in verse 21, right before the verse we just read. Number two, that he would be killed and be raised up on the third day, that was verse 22. And then those who choose to follow him must deny himself, take up their death basically daily, and follow him, that was verse 23. In other words, Jesus was telling his disciples that they better make sure they want to be his follower because whoever chooses that pathway will see a completely altered life than the one that they were living before. Verse 23 tells us that losing yourself to make Christ Lord will wreck your own personal self-advancement in your life. It'll wreck where you were headed. Because if you really say, Jesus, I want to make you Lord of my life. Jesus, I, I, I know you saved me, but I, I want to follow you. And I want to follow you just like the disciples did. I want to follow you where, where I really get it. And it's not just about like just fire insurance or just, just not just about like I just need you to save me. God, I, I also want to make you Lord of my life. If we really get it like that, then it's going to change our life. We can't keep living our life the same way we were. And for those of us who are living our life daily, saying, I want to make Jesus Lord today and tomorrow and the next day, every day we wake up, the question is, God, what do you want from me today? Not, God, I'm already good because I prayed. Losing yourself to make Christ Lord wrecks our own personal 
self-advancement. If you look at this word deny right here in this verse, the Greek word rendered, rendered here is arneomai, which means basically to deny, to disown, to repudiate. Further, it carries the idea to disregard, to pay no attention to, to say no to. All of a person's desires and motives and dreams and hopes and ambitions are submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ if they're going to choose to be his follower. Think of Jesus and the rich young ruler, that story. What did Jesus tell the rich young ruler? He said, give up everything that you have and you can follow me. Just give up your possessions. Just give up stuff and you can follow me. But isn't it interesting how sometimes even stuff, even things, not even just people or not even just goals or dreams, but even things keep us from loving God more. In our day and age, we want to be told, I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay. But the truth is, we are not okay. We are selfish, we are prideful, we hurt others, and we are nothing if we do not surrender ourselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we were in a room with Kanye West, which was kind of an interesting thing. I don't know if I'll ever experience anything like it again. And, I, and it was just, I mean, it was just an amazing thing. And I think everybody in the room was expecting Kanye to walk in, all right, because it was kind of all, everybody, there was cops there. There was, it was 12,000 students there. Everybody was there kind of to hear Kanye West. And, and Kanye, I was very impressed because he just came right in with about a 60, I think it was probably about a 60-person choir is what we saw. And he just was dressed like everybody else, and he came in, and he came on stage. He only really did anything really out of the ordinary for about three or four songs. Other than that, he was just basically a part of, of the room with everybody else, a part of the worshipers with everybody else. And we watched and we just all participated really. I mean, if you'd ever heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, we basically just got to worship with about a choir of 60 is basically what we did. But in one of the songs where Kanye got up, he said this, he said, the devil had me, but Jesus can even save a wretch like me. Did he mean it? I don't know. Did you? I don't really want to get into that conversation today, but I would ask this. If the tables were turned, would people believe that you meant it? We always love to ask, well, did he really mean it? Did she really mean it? What about their past? What about that? And we ask all these questions, but here's the thing. Man, what if, people, what if the tables were turned? What if people started pointing the finger at us? Did you mean it? Can I just say this, man? Aren't we glad that God does not judge us on our pasts? When was the last time we were humbled again, reminded again, that in our pride we thought we were good without God, good without others, good without surrendering to his lordship? Isn't the question we ask about Kanye the same one that Luke 9 is asking us today? Did you make Christ your savior and your lord? And really, ultimately, he's not savior if he's not first your lord. Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with your mouth the Lord is, Jesus, and then it goes on and says, you will be saved. That's why we say, I think when we baptize people, I, I never really thought about this much before, but I think this is why we say it. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Because if he's not your Lord, I can't guarantee you from Scripture he's your Savior. The question is, have you given your life to him? Not do you understand a bunch of things in your head about whether or not he did what he did for you. We will always teach here at Grace Point that both making Jesus your Lord and your Savior are necessary for salvation, not just one. Understanding salvation is one thing, but living like you love Jesus is what we're after. The Apostle Paul, he summarized a believer's life in Galatians 2.20 by saying this, I am crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I believe that then the next step that Paul is teaching here and that Luke is teaching as well is that then the next step should be that I should then give my life back to him. You and I, we better be sure that we are fully prepared to lay down our own plans our prominence, our motives, our ideas, our dreams, our ambitions, our hopes, and our, all of our desires in full and complete surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ because he is Lord of all. and He must be acknowledged as Lord of our lives if we're going to continue to claim to be his people. If he's not Lord of all, he's probably not Lord at all in your life. In submission to Christ's lordship, we daily take up the life of Christ. He is shaping within us 
and that he has planned for us. We also lose ourselves to make Christ Lord in every part of our life, and we do so to magnify God's faithfulness in our lives. Look back with me at verse 24. Let's look at what it says next. It says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? We heard an illustration, a group of 55 that went last week. From a speaker at our conference last week named Jonathan Evans. I got a picture. Heather and I went and got a picture with him, I think. Is, we got, there we go. Oh, pop it back up. I'll get to his, that one right there in a second. Go back, go back, go back. Sorry. Sorry, I messed up. All right, but we heard an illustration from a speaker. I forgot I put that quote next to the picture. But we heard an illustration from a speaker at our conference named Jonathan Evans. And I, my ears especially perked up because I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and he said he was the chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys. And I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Not only is he the chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys, um, he also is the brother of Priscilla Shire, if any of you guys have ever heard of her. And he's also the son of Tony Evans, uh, who is actually the first African-American to ever translate the full Bible by himself, which is a really cool accomplishment. He just did that last year or so. And so um, just a really amazing family, really amazing family. But he began to tell a story to us when he was chaplain of Dallas Cowboys about a guy named Jerry Brown Jr. who passed away, died in a car wreck. He said, Jason Garrett, who was the coach of the Cowboys at that time and just up until recently, came down the steps of the plane that all the players were basically about to ride to their game on. Actually, they were coming here to Cincinnati to go play the Bengals. He said, Jason Garrett came down the plane and he met the chaplain, Jonathan Evans, at the bottom of the plane, and he said, we've just had a player pass away, and everybody on the plane's a wreck. Can you go talk to him? Jonathan Evans said, I, I don't know what to say. He said, but I went, he said, I went up, and I, I said whatever I said, and we made it through, and we made it through the flight, and we got to the game, and he said, we were standing there for the national anthem at the game the next day, and he said, and then they, they came over the loudspeaker, and they said, and now a moment of silence. For Jerry Brown Jr., so about 20, maybe 15, 20 seconds went by. So then everybody kind of picked back up. Kickoff happened, and the game went on. And he said, I leaned over to DeMarcus Ware, who was a defensive end for the Dallas Cowboys at the time. And he said, and isn't that something? That everything you do for humanity, you get about 15 to 20 seconds for it right there. What an amazing thing it is that what we do for God, that he blesses us with eternity. God's economy of faith works differently than ours. We could spend our whole life, man, working and working and working, and you know what? Maybe nobody will ever even remember us two or three generations from now. But God tells us what we do for him will last When you surrender your life to the one who loves you enough to die with you, you will get to celebrate for all eternity. You'll get to sit around and you'll be be with him basically forever. God's economy of faith works in direct opposition to most of the assumptions by which we and our humanity operate. Consider all the divine paradoxes that are all throughout Scripture. One's right here. If you want to save your life, then lose it. Give it up. 1 Peter 5, 6, if you want to be exalted, then humble yourself. Get on your knees more. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, if you want to receive, then give. Matthew 6, 33, if you want to have your needs met, make them secondary to pursuing Christ, where it says seek first the kingdom of God, and then everything else gets added to you that God wants to add to you. Instead of you just adding all those things on your own, that will fade away. God reveals his faithfulness to us through those things his faithfulness to us through those paradoxical realities. What Jesus promises to those who choose to deny themselves, to take up their cross daily and follow him, is that in losing their life for his sake, we will actually discover true life. Everything that we would hope life could possibly be is produced for us by grace when we submit to the lordship of Christ. If you and I want to live for Christ in this world, we must give up the idea that if we work hard enough, save long enough, and do enough good, that we can finally create a safe environment for us and our family. There is no way to preserve your life. Somehow, we can produce a trouble-free environment, finally enjoy life on our own. That is humanism or Americanism 
or some other kind of ism, but that is not living under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We will miss the experience of true life if we're busy trying to always create safe places for us and the people that we love. Instead, if we will be sold out to Christ's kingdom agenda, allowing our lives to be spent for the glory of his name, then we will begin to experience abundant life. Life is found in only one way, that's in Christ, not in saving our lives, but in surrendering them to him, his agenda, his will, his plan, his purpose. Now I want to put the quote up, all right? This is something we heard this weekend too, and it was so good. Jonathan Evans said this, for those of you guys who say, man, am I making Christ Lord of my life today? Am I, am I still there? Was I there? Do I need to get back there? He said this, he says, if you don't maintain the integrity of your calling, you will never experience it's the greatness of your calling. Let me just tell you something. You know what burdens this pastor's heart more than anything for you? Is that because of the American Christianity that just surrounds us sometimes and sometimes seeps into us sometimes, you'll get so close saying, God, I want my life to be all about you. But you'll miss it. You'll miss it because you understand everything but you've never just truly surrendered and said, God, I want to make you the Lord of my life. I don't want anybody in this room to sit here and think, well, I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I know he saved me. There's people who say that to me all the time. I know that Jesus did what he did for me. I'm like, but there's no joy in it for you. There's no joy. That's what burdens my heart more than anything because I want you to have the joy, the same experience that I'm getting to experience in this life of knowing that Jesus has my every day and I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I get on my knees. This book's been wrecking me. Been wrecking me because, man, I'll tell you, I'd love to see our church do amazing things, but you know what I want to see more than that? I want to see each and every single one of us learn how to really surrender our life to him. That's what I want more than anything. If you don't maintain the integrity of your calling, man, you'll get so close, but you'll never experience the greatness of the calling and the life that God has for each and every one of you. Luke, he finishes with this in verse 26. He says, if anyone is ashamed of me, and this is, where, this is a good part, so stick with me, all right? Sorry, that was kind of, I'm, 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 I'm just sharing with you my heart this morning. I ain't got to do that very much lately. I've been on student trips and trips with my wife, which was amazing, by the way, and I mean, just getting to do all those things. But here's the thing, I'm so excited to see what God wants to do in us this year. I'm so excited. I, I don't know what God wants to do as we knock this wall out and we move into this worship space over here and as we keep moving forward and try to knock out all this space. I don't know how many kids God's going to bring us and how many lives we're going to get to see changed. I don't know, but you know what I do know? Is every single day that we wake up and we say, Jesus, we just want to live our life surrendered fully to you. It begins to become amazing what God wants to do with us, doesn't it? It begins to be an amazing, amazing thing. Verse 26, it says this. We'll wrap up. These are our last verses for today. It says, if anyone is ashamed of me in my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory, and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I tell you the truth, though, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God. Now, that sounds like a negative verse right there at the end, but I want to read that last part and read it really close. Verse 27 just kind of sticks out because there's a lot of maybe even questions about what Jesus meant here. But look with me at verse 27. It says, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God. You know what happens when you lose yourself to make Christ Lord of your life? You get to begin to see God's kingdom happening here on earth. And that is an awesome thing to get to be a part of. When you start realizing that life's not just about you and life's not just about making a buck and life's not just about your family and life's not just about all the little things in your little bubble and you begin to just kind of just look out over the horizon a little bit with God and you begin to see that God's kingdom on earth is happening all around, that's when life gets to be really, really interesting for those who have surrendered our lives to him. He says, some of those standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God, which means they're gonna see the kingdom of God now on earth happening things God, that God is doing, they're going to get to be directly involved with it even before they die. 
And some theologians they say, well, is he referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? That's about to happen in Acts, all right? For the disciples, all right? That, all the people who experienced that, is that what he's talking about? Or some people would argue, is he referring to his own death, burial, and victorious resurrection, that they're going to get to see that? Some people would argue, is he referring to his ascension into heaven or to the transfiguration? Look that up later if you don't know what that is. That, he's just talking about Peter, James, and John getting to experience that. Here's the thing. I think Jesus left it ambiguous on purpose. No doubt the lack of clarity among biblical scholars here is so that we all understand that all of these things that scholars think maybe he's talking about signify the coming of the kingdom of God. And through God's continuing work among the nations, his kingdom is still coming. It's still happening here on this earth. God is still doing stuff and changing people's hearts and lives. That's what it means to be involved in the kingdom of God, to get to be a part of that. To say, for, for me, even last Sunday night, to get to be a part of Dylan receiving Christ, what a special gift. Pastor Spencer, in just a little bit, to get to baptize with his wife. Next service, his sister-in-law. What a special gift. We have special gifts that God wants to give us every single day, just like that. If we'll realize that his kingdom, man, we can experience not up in heaven one day, but even before we die. His kingdom, you guys, is still coming. Rest assured and be glad that in the heart of the unbelieving world all around us, among Muslims and animists and Buddhists and Hindus, native religions and non-religions, God's kingdom is still coming to this earth. Amen? His kingdom's still coming in Vietnam and Malaysia and Bhutan. His kingdom's still coming in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe and Sudan and Mauritania and Libya and Syria. His kingdom is still coming in Cincinnati and Dayton and Franklin and Springboro and Miamisburg and Hamilton. Among all the peoples of the earth. Because one day, people from every tongue, tribe, and nation gather around the eternal throne Jesus Christ, worshiping him alone forever and ever and ever. Because Jesus is Lord in so many people's hearts and lives, and also just because Jesus is Lord, the kingdom of God is advancing. But the big question this morning is this, is Jesus Lord of your life, or is he just the Savior? If you want to experience me, and what I'm doing, Jesus says, you have to leave you. You have to leave you behind and all the things that you want. And you have to say, man, I want my wants and my desires, God, to be your wants and your desires. A big problem that we have here with American Christianity is that we love to see people make initial commitments for God. But many of us never find out what it means to truly get caught up and truly losing our own way day after day after day for his. We end up crashing, struggling, hurting, instead of joining him in the journey of making Christ known to so many in our lifetime, he would have us take. I read another story about a captain of a ship who looked out in front of him. This was back 1940s. Ship captain, he looked out into the dark night and he saw faint lights in the distance like sometime you would see in the shipping lanes as you travel. Immediately, the captain, he told his signalman to send a message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. Promptly, a return message was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain was angered. His command had been ignored. He wasn't used to being ignored, so he sent a second message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am the captain. Soon another message was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am Seaman Third Class Jones. Immediately, the captain sent a third message, knowing the fear that it would evoke. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a battleship. Then the reply came back. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. Jesus spoke to people. He was walking around this world, and he said this. He said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The voice that we hear is greater than any third-class officer in a lighthouse. 
The voice that we hear happens to be the light of the world. And we ignore it at our own peril. For we trust and we obey him so that he can truly save us from ourselves. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? And I just want to ask everybody in the room a question. This morning, have you truly surrendered your life to the Savior? Do you recognize that the life giver knows more about your life than you do? It would be wrong of me this morning to preach a sermon on whether or not you've made Jesus just your Savior if you've made him your Lord without giving you an opportunity this morning to truly make him the Lord of your life. And here's the thing, here's how you do that. Don't miss this. You don't just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I trust in you. But you tell him, Jesus, because I trust in you, because I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, because I believe that you are God, that you are the one who rose from the dead. Jesus, I want to, the best I know how, I'm not going to be perfect at it, but the best I know how, I want to live my life for you. God, I don't want to live my life just for me anymore. I don't want to live a selfish life, God. I want to live a life like you, Jesus, giving my life up for you and for others. And God, however you would lead, I just, I want to give my life today to you. this morning, that's you. You'd say, you know what? I understand what Jesus has done for. I've heard about Jesus my entire life. But I've never had a moment in my life where I've said, Jesus, today, I want to begin to live for you. And if that's you this morning, you say, Pastor Reagan, I need to make that choice today. I need to make that decision today. I want to begin to live my life today for Jesus. If that's you today, would you just look up at me? coming out, I'm looking for you. I won't touch you or anything. I'm not going to come all the way back to you. <laughs> but would you look up at me this morning if that's you? I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else this morning? Thank you. If that's you this morning and you would say today, Today, I want to begin to live my life for Jesus. On your blue card that's in your worship guide, you should have gotten one of those when you came in today. You can just check the box that says, today, I would like to give my life to Jesus. For the first time today, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. And you can check that, or you can write something in the comments. If there's something that God's just stirring in your heart, then we would love to know about that, and we'll follow up with you this week have one of our men or one of our ladies just have coffee with you or just come hang out with you however it works but you can come up here to the church if you want to because we would love to help you understand more about what that means to give your life fully to Jesus also during this next song you have something that you'd like for us to pray for I'm gonna be up here in the front Pastor Ben and Pastor Spencer are in the back we have some ladies around as well. If you just have something this morning that you just say, man, I just need prayer. During these 40 days of prayer, I just need prayer. You can mark it on your blue card, but we'll pray for you right now if you'd allow us to during this next song. Love to pray for whatever God is doing in your life, whatever prayer you need this morning. Jesus, would you help us to be a church that loves to pray? Would you help us to be a church that doesn't just want you to be our fire insurance one day? Save us one day, but God, would you help us to be a church that wants to live for you today? We love you, Jesus. We give this time to you to allow your Holy Spirit, God, just to move however you see fit in our hearts and in our lives. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen.